Good morning again. Um, as I shared earlier, we are entering into this season of Lent, and the theme is to lean in, lean in. Today, the first set in this series is called Take the Test, Take the Test. Around the world, when kids, or, or I shouldn't say kids, uh, young adults, <laughs> are about 15 or 16 year, years old, they look forward to something. They look forward to taking a driver's test. They usually seek out lessons. They try to get in pra practice. They even have this sticker I noticed on a couple of cars here in Hyde Park that announce student driver, so you know who's in front of you when you're driving. And even if you learn later in life, we have places like Nova, which is actually a high park owned business. They're there to assist people to learn how to drive. There are two parts to a driving test. One is written and one is actually performed. And if you pass both of those, you get to pass through the door of independent mobility. A whole new world is open. Maybe some of you remember the first time you got your driver's license. You had your very own driver's license and what that meant. This is a deep moment of satisfaction when you get that card that announces, no, you're not a permit, no, you don't have someone to have someone with you in the car, but you can drive a car all by yourself. But the test doesn't really stop there, does it? Have you been on the road lately? <laughs> As it relates to driving, there are all kinds of tests that come to us daily when we're on the world. Amazingly, to the degree that we follow the rules of the road, it can be a pleasant experience. But you will notice that many of us don't exactly follow the rules. Tests. Stop signs get ignored. Tests. Speed limits get ignored. Tests. Kindness toward others driving around you ignored. There's one test I've been failing over in Washington Heights. They have this speed camera. And I've gotten enough tickets, and I finally have been taught. I finally know how to drive at 25 miles per hour when driving through Washington Heights. I mean, it's automatic now. Yesterday, you're not gonna get me one more time. I finally learned and passed the test. But needless to say, there are tests that not only test what we know, what we're able to perform, there are tests that test who we actually are. In the biblical text today, Jesus is tested for sure. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he took time away to be all by himself. He fasted. He was physically weak, but spiritually, Jesus was strong. There is an invitation for us during Lent to give something up in order to make time for Jesus. To be spiritually strong, maybe not <laughs> as much physically. Each year, I really like to think about this. What am I going to give up during Lent? This year, I gave up two things, one, one of which I'll share with you all today, retail therapy. I don't want you to assume that I do a lot of retail therapy, but I do do my fair share of retail therapy. It has been neat because in this moment, I have been invited to reflect on what is it I need and what are simply wants. It has challenged me to see how I can be creative in addressing my needs. But it has also opened me up to conversation between me and God about what is really missing in my own life for which no amount of retail therapy can replace. I need this time just as Jesus needed that time away, just as new drivers need that time to prepare, just as perhaps you need time to prepare for the test of life that will surely come your way. Part of taking the test is being ready. As spring break is popping up on many college campuses, many undergraduate students can more effectively relate to this message as they are preparing or not preparing to take tests before they go on spring break. Jesus gets tested. He's physically weak, but he's spiritually strong by the devil in three areas. Just think about, have you ever been tested literally or spiritually in these areas? Number one, hunger. If you are hungry, command these stones to become bread. Number two, power. To you, I will give all glory and authority if you worship me. And last three, protection, security. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. All of these are vulnerable areas. All of these are potentially Achilles heels for us. 
And let's look at each of them a little bit more closely, hunger. I've been reading these documents of the early slave trade when it was just being set up on the west coast of Africa. There were these dungeons that were created right at the ocean to hold bodies separately, men and women. Some of what we learn is certain, men and women, perhaps without their full knowledge of what was going on, were sold by tribes. And before being shipped off, they were kept in dungeons at the ocean. They were not let out to relieve themselves. They were packed like sardines with very little ventilation. Many died before ever even being boarded on ships. There were all kinds of wailing and crying going on in these dungeons, people wanting to get free to go back to their tribes. And the men who were sent to check on these bodies would have to put something literally over their nose because the stench was so bad that smelling it would cause them to vomit. And as I'm reading this account, there is a hunger, even hundreds of years later, for righteousness. Most of us know what hunger is like. It doesn't have to be cultivated. A hunger for fairness. I know you guys get that. A hunger for those who are most vulnerable. A hunger for those who are most on the edge. A hunger for kids who do not get the best start in life. A hunger for those living with violence on top of violence. A hunger for women to have agency and choice over their bodies. A hunger for democracy and the pursuit of happiness for people all over the world. Our hunger is not just for food and probably not food at all really. A hunger for the justice of God's people. Isaiah 55 says, let everyone who thirsts, let them come to the waters and let all those who have no money, let them come by and eat. Come by without money and without price. Why spend money for that which is not bread or your labor for that which does not satisfy? Incline your ear and come to me. The second was power. I left my television on last night intentionally. It's hard to look at the war between Russia and Ukraine. Let me say that again. It is hard to look at the war between Russia and Ukraine. It just is. But it was also hard for me to look at the Rwanda war. Correction, the Rwanda genocide, where 1,1,443,225 people were killed or to look at the Syrian war, which became the fertile ground for Iraq, giving birth to ISIS, where 451,000 people died, or the Afghanistan war, where 71,000 civilians were killed by us, or the Iran-Iraq war, or the many wars that have happened over the last 20 years, or the war against Boko Haram, where girls going to school just disappear in hundreds, Listening last night and over the past week to civilians in Ukraine is hard. But what is harder for me to listen to is women in Afghanistan plead for help. Their voices are silent now. We look at power and we see how power is often used for other people's gain and rarely used to help those that most need it. It is a drug for which horrible things have been done by those who have it. Very few can handle it, and there should be lots of checks and balances. And we can see through word that, after, that often we use it to protect only our interests. Like, why is the U.S. interested in Ukraine? Jesus recognized this temptation right away. We have the power we need to do good in the world. We can use power for good, but we also can use power to really do some horrific things. The last temptation was protection. Most of us want to feel safe. A whole campaign was run off the plan for that somehow Americans were not safe. We are living in rough times. America is at risk. Our fears and our anxieties run high. We can even see it in our kids. COVID, violence, wars, peer pressure, family drama, crime. The list could go on. It's like duck, duck, goose, you're it. One of my friends I hadn't seen in months and I saw her last week and I was talking 
And it shocked me when, she, when I learned that she had been carjacked, that her car had been taken literally in the night at Best Buy, and that it had taken months to repair it and get it back in order. At first she thought about giving it up until she went to the dealership, and then it was like, maybe I better get my car fixed <laughs> after all. Protection, safety, we wanted peace of mind, having to look over our shoulders, having to be vigilant. In the words of the rap artist Kendrick Lamar, we gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. That's what we hope for in protection. Jesus' tests involve real issues that most of us can relate to. We can relate to hunger for justice. We can relate to power. We can relate to protection. And in each instance, Jesus turns to God. And Jesus, in turning to God, declares, we're going to be all right. Could there be a slight hint for us today? I notice with the kids, as they grow older, they become more and more independent. But when life is uncertain for a young person, they go back to their parents, don't they? Why? For reassurance, for answers, for help for support, I need help. Jesus is like, I have what I need already. The gospel song says it even better, long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. An American investment banker went on vacation. He was on the small coastal Mexican village when he saw a small boat with just one fisherman docked in it. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna the American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked, how long did it take you to catch them? The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't he stay out longer and catch more fish? And the Mexican replied, because I have enough to support my family's immediate need. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? And the Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late fish a little, play with my children, take siestas with my wife Maria, stroll into the village each if evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoff. I am a Harvard MBA and could help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually you would have a fleet of fishing boats Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. You would control the product, the processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and eventually New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will all of this take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then, asked the Mexican. The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions? Then what, said the Mexican. The American said, then you would retire move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your amigos. Nah, the devil tempts us with what we think we don't have. Part of our test is realizing what we do have. It's always been easier to see what we don't have. I'm always trying to tell my son what he has. <laughs> Probably need to tell myself too. And maybe we all need to remind ourselves that we are so blessed. We have a home. We have an awesome faith community and all kinds of blessings that are knocking on our door daily. We have laughter and good conversations and we have somebody we can call up personally. We don't have to go through hoops you guys can even have my personal phone number, it's out there. <laughs> we have Bibles and Bible studies. We have time to stroll in the park, sip some wine, and listen to good music. And we can continue to help others with our stewardship financially and time-wise. 
and we can still hunger for justice all over the world because it is needed. And when we are in, we can always turn to God. When we are in trouble, we can turn to God and sometimes each other. Let all who thirst, says Isaiah 55, and hunger come to God. Our hunger, our power, and protection are tied up in God and each other. We reject capitalism that always places profit and power over people. We, like the humble fishermen, have so much already. Sometimes we just need to remember that we have it. So, I know I don't have to convince you. You all know tests will come in our life. I have one friend. Her test must be driving because every time I'm on the phone with her, she's talking to all these cars around her. And I like trying to figure out, is she talking to me or is she talking to the cars? But all of us get different kinds of tests. We don't get the same kind of test. And maybe your test is parenting. Maybe your test is being a student. Maybe your test is really being a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe your test is your mouth and what comes out of it. Maybe your test is your heart and the things that you think secretly about. But tests come, tests will arrive, and sometimes we'll fail them, and sometimes we pass them, and sometimes we don't even know how we did on the test. But each test, if we're humble enough, is there to teach us if we're willing to learn. And when we fail, the beauty of life is you get to take the test again. We don't know what's going to be on the test, but like Jesus, we are not alone. That's what we're reminded of during this Lent season. We are not alone. We can always turn to God. We turn to a lot of things, amen? <laughs> but we can turn to God, preferably over the option, other options. So let us during this Lent lean in. Let's lean in. Trust what you know. Trust what life has taught you. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. You got this. There were others before us. There is nothing new, says Ecclesiastes, under the sun. Jesus crushed the test in this text, and so can we. Take the test. Amen. <laughs>